Neurotech San Francisco Hack Night. Neurotech X is an international community that facilitates the advancement of neurotechnology. Our pillars are community, education, and innovation. We have chapters worldwide, meetup events, and a thriving online community, over 5,000 members on Slack. So check if uh, your local community already has a chapter. If not, please get in touch. We'd love to help you set one up. Uh, maybe your college or university already has one. If not, uh, also happy to help you set one up. Get a, find a link to the Slack on our um, meetup agenda or meetup um, and check out learn.neurotechxedu.com uh, for uh, both lessons and uh, lists of, of devices. Stay up uh, on the Neurotech field with the newsletter and check out uh, our Neurotech X Services job board. Okay. So I, I was at the Neurotech X Zurich meeting or, you know, inaugural meeting and uh, and he, he did a much better job of explaining all the pillars. <laughs> like <what they're> <laughs> I really got to work out a the script for this um but it, it was cool it's cool to see abby and zurich and uh um you know there really is a lot in in zurich that they can draw on um so so who was doing it i know, I know abby was like, yeah employed yeah. to do that to some extent but yeah, yeah yeah with the other people <laughs> and and mark uh who's who's actually joined us here um it like super early on mark joined us and um i'm trying to remember his last name mokowitz uh, and you know other the other principles of of uh, i done Let's see if i can But, but uh, a nice, nice presentation. And do you know if there's going to be, uh, I don't know, the, the Zurich group are going to have a particular emphasis in virtue of things people do there or? Well, they, they definitely, mm, I, I, you know, they certainly had a lot of people that were coming out of neuroprosthetics and, uh, and like other strengths of of ETH, you know, and and yeah, but I I, I asked him about um, uh, Nicholas Langer because uh, who, who developed the Auto Magic toolbox, so it's like a automated EEG pre-processing toolbox, which and it was I was happy to hear that he he'd met him before. So that was cool. It, and Nicholas has done a lot of the um, uh, process, EEG processing, the Child Mind Institute data. And, um, and of course, you know, I was like, you need to add the, the translational neuromodeling units as, as one of the, you know, one of the groups, one of the awesome groups there. Uh, so hopefully that will be up on, um, I mean, I, I think they were recording it, so it should be up on YouTube. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, yeah. So that was that was this morning, <laughs> and uh, it has been an insane week of of things, uh, conferences and uh, symposia. Um, a really great, uh, you know, like the Stanford Neuro Health meeting to this th today um, ended with a really great presentation of electrogastrograms. <laughs> and yeah, and not only, you know, so, uh, yeah, learned a lot. 
it, what was cool was that also how he related or he had some some interesting information about doing microbiome analysis because obviously he cares about the gut um, and that actually one of the issues with just trying to capture microbiome from your poop is that you lose this the I mean basically your your flora no your fauna uh, have a um, have a spatial distribution in the gut and so you losing that in in addition to getting kind of like a random sample of what uh, is passing um, you've you've lost you know that spatial information and that it turns out to be rather valuable um, so it, it was interesting to see the kind of multimodal imaging that they were doing um, both to get kind of like ground truth but then trying to use these you know these arrays of electrodes and uh, and apparently it was quite it was quite common and popular in the in the 1980s so there's actually a CPT code for doing an EGG <laughs> which you know it, which means that you can bill for it in insurance <laughs> which I thought was a, a funny a funny quirk um, so, so 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 the the imaging gut flora and doing well, they're, they're, EG on the gut they're they're imaging the gut so so he what he wanted to then relate it to various diseases and things like that and some of and what was nice about his presentation uh this was Todd Coleman who uh I think is currently at UCSD but is moving to Stanford and um it is interesting because he's giving you, you know, like like the gut's not just this this sack. <laughs> There's there, it has a lot of uh, it has a lot more complexity to it. So he gave kind of an intro to that, as well as like the many different ways in which the the gut can fail or you know be, be both have you know disease process and 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 uh, insults and. Yeah. So, and then some of those relate to, uh, you know, things that you'd want to check a person's, you know, poop and see how they're, how well they're digesting and things like that. Right. So that was, that was when, you know, it was when he started talking about the relationship of these EGGs with your microbiome that the microbiome stuff came up. Um, it, he, he actually ended with being really interested in doing EGG and EEG. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was, that was cool too. Um, uh, so, some of the other talks were very, very fash, very fash, F fash, fash. Yeah, oh, is it to do EGG or to do EEG? Uh, well, you know, you know, like, um, brain gut interactions yeah yeah that's very on vogue stuff so doing edg with eg i would say that's super fast yeah and and not not to you know not to question its scientific you that's know uh, meaningfulness in the slightest but yeah super fresh <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know he talked about I mean, it was it was cool because he talked about basically why it kind of died out in the late '80s, like, and it it was felt like you weren't getting anything useful, and then and then he talked about how they kind of reapproached the problem, and um, and what what they are able to do. So I I thought like the other the other talks were. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's, some some of them were also great, um, uh, but but much more specific in terms of say, you know, very specific uh, autism treatments and things like that. Um, this this was you know kind of eye opening in terms of all the kinds of disorders that you could potentially relate this to, and and it was neurotechy in a sense of like how he was getting the data. And and how he was uh, checking, or you know, certainly like a big a big part of the variability they eventually found was that um, was when you would look at CTs and see where the ribs were basically in relation to the 
where the where the electrodes have been placed and um, yeah. So, so did they try to do at some point a source localization with the uh, EEG electrodes? Well, they 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 weren't. I mean, to some degree, yes, but not 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 really. You know, I mean, they were definitely going for an array and and doing some you know some post processing in terms of like where they felt they were getting the best signal and the most indicative physiological signal that they that they cared about um sort of I and mean, it was definitely it was sort of there and i've i've seen uh at eit conferences or electrical impedance tomography conferences um it, it, it like it, it's one of the it's one of the only areas of the body that like eit is actually used um uh clinically already and um so you can use it in ICUs. So it, you can get a kind of a, a sense of like what's what's in the gut, or um, yeah. So that that was actually some of the some of the the things that he was interested in. So I wouldn't be surprised. He said he had to pick and choose like how many topics he covered, but I bet you they've done some some EIT where they're injecting current, and um, yeah. And getting getting a sense of like how much the food's been processed and how close they're to evacuation, <laughs> as they put it. Uh, but, but awesome talk. I think I think the um, the Wusai uh, Neuroscience Center is is putting this all up on the web. Um, so I, I think these will all be all be available. They 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 weren't using like. Crowdcaster. Um, here, I was just going to check YouTube. It's it. No. It's not the Wu Tang. Yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing new stuff on there. Oh, okay. Now, what they what they do have up on YouTube uh, is you can see the uh, triangulating intelligence uh, symposium that was yesterday. That was uh, a really great uh, set of speakers focused on you know more like AI, deep learning, uh, computational neuroscience, and you know what you might call uh, computational cognitive neuroscience. So you know it's, it's like they had um, was it Matthew Botvinnik? Is it the the deep mind? Yeah. Uh, you know he's he started out the session. Here, let me get the and that was. Uh, Some some very cool stuff from um, uh, from is it, uh, Josh is it Josh Tenenbaum at uh, at MIT who's like got the you know he does a lot of like cognitive development but but you know trying to get it so they they like will use cam data that's attached to an infant's head <laughs> and then like see what neural nets can can decipher of the world from just the you know the optic flow on this camera and you're, you're kind of seeing the world from from the infant's perspective and um uh, uh yeah i highly recommend that and uh let me just pull up the So you might, if you check out the agenda this week, you might see like how much was going on at the same time. Um, yeah, and uh, you, yeah, there was a really nice, I don't know if, um, if Ryan were, were you able to get a link of that AR in neurosurgery? 
meeting? I have not been able to. Oh, I, I don't know if they've if they've actually made the video available. Yeah. But I haven't been able to find the video. But it, it was it was cool. It was, you know, what was super interesting about it, again, you can find this the find the link at least to the, the meeting details on the, the meetup agenda. But um, but super practical things like like, you know, I'm drilling into your head <laughs> and and I'm wearing a HoloLens. And so I I can, you know, the HoloLens is is displaying to me where where the drill bit's gonna come out or, you know, like inside you and uh, super practical things. And then they were showing, they were testing um, testing it out uh, on a bench when they're not doing surgery. Uh, that uh, some, some really, it was a really nice demo of, of you know, what, what seemed like much more practical AR uh, applications than, than say, you know, some of the, VR visualizations that I see that come out of, of brain science stuff. Um, and yeah, Allen Institute also did something yesterday. Um, this future brain health that, uh, that was, that was pretty impressive set of speakers. I don't, I don't really follow all the cardiovascular stuff that they, you know, that made up a, a good amount of their, their talks, but um, at the same time, we know that that's a, a real, you know, if not number one killer, um, is also uh, a huge source of dementia as well as as you know stroke and its its issues. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if anybody's been catching BCI Samara, but. Um, you know, Yannick certainly had a, a great set of speakers. Um, I, I've, yeah, and live Meeg is also going on, <laughs> which, which you know, was uh, a, a quite, quite incredible. I mean, it was interesting what they focused on because a lot of it was was focused on things like registered reports. I mean, it was it was interesting because you kind of expect an EEG. EMEG conference to, to be all, you know, analysis techniques and things like that. And, and yeah, I think it, a lot of it was actually made up by, you know, how do we, how do we do reproducible work and how do we do, you know, how do we get more support behind pre-registration and, um, uh, yeah, I, I thought I thought the the agenda suggested some some real con, you know alternative considerations that don't always make up the a meeting's you know main points. Um, that but that was super interesting, and an incredible attend. I mean, it was ended up at like twelve hundred people. I think would see those numbers in Crowdcast. Um, Yeah, and then Morgan, you are mute. Morgan, I I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, it looks like. Someone okay. who did join accidentally pressed the mute all button it, and said that yeah. they're mute. It's it, it happens. Um, but uh, um, I don't know if it, so. Did everybody catch that Kyle Matheson won the early career award at uh, the Society for Physiological Research? And, and it, so I posted a link on Slack of the. Um, his his uh, a YouTube video of his uh, his talk, and uh, very focused on his bicycle work, which which is cool. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the video is sped up to uh, 1.5 <laughs> because, or it is a yeah, 
a very fast reading of the <laughs> of what his talk was. So I don't know if he had to compress it into 30 minutes and this was his way to do it, but um, uh, yeah. So hey, uh, is uh, Jaden with us? I don't know. If, I, I know that Jaden might not be might not be able to make it tonight. Um, how about Kashal? No. Okay. So one thing. So some students from UC Davis uh, had got in touch about about the Muse, and um, they really wanted to. So when they said they wanted to control a light bulb. Um, I, I assumed that it was like a Phillips hue or something like that. What they, what they really meant was they had like a breadboard and an LED attached to a Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> and so then the obvious thing was, well, why not just attach your, you know, dongle to the Raspberry Pi and not worry about any additional communication beyond just getting the the Muse, you know, Muse LSL to work on Raspberry Pi. And um, so ha have you played with that at all, John? Because it, it was it was non-trivial. <laughs> okay, I think you're muted. I did look into that once. Okay. But I don't remember how far I got. Yeah, um, so. but yeah, there's like specific Raspberry Pi OS things that I do I do recall running into. Yeah, yeah, it it. So I mean, it does seem I was I was thinking about uh, trying to get in touch with um, uh, who's the Mind Effect guy? It's like Jason Farquhar. Um. Anybody else? I, I, I know that Jaden had a mind effect. Um, anybody else have one of those? But uh, they are trying to use the Muse 2 with a uh, BLE, I guess. Yeah, Jason Farquhar. Um, yes, Muse 2. And because if they have the Blue Giga dongle, it should be straightforward even in the Raspberry Pi, the communication. Well, no. it, it, it's it's not the it's not the communication. It, it's actually it's uh, it's LSL, or certainly like the 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 part that was falling falling down was that um, you couldn't pip install the uh, Pi LSL, or you know like that was that was the first thing that was going to fail, and. Uh, and this is, it's actually come up before in terms of like, if you check on the lab streaming layer Slack, there's, or the, um, or some of the issues about the person who built the, um, the wheels for the, the Pi Pi, Pi LSL. Um, they're like making that the, the lib LSL cross platform was apparently a bit of a problem. And um, and I think it's kind of come up. Um, hey, hey, Alex, was the, um, the the Jason in Toronto, the Blue Muse developer? OK. Maybe Alex has stepped away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just thinking well, like well, because if they want to control only um, LED, why LSL? They could just get the raw data and process the data. Like they, they can they can just bypass it. So so they don't actually need the. Uh, you're you're right. I mean, how how would they talk to Muse? You need stream on OSC with the uh, um, if. The, with the blue jig, I will be just like um, serial serial port comments. Oh, just just have have a direct. Sure, I I think they were hoping to to just do some some scripting of existing stuff. <laughs> and yeah. and honestly, like 
Like, I think it would be people have definitely worked on a, a an ARM lib LSL, right? So, so if you check out issue 55 of, of um, Muse LSL, uh, there's some discussion about this. Uh, Alexander Barishon has, has chimed in and, and the issue is still open, but there's, there's some, there's some people who've, who've worked on things and, and lab streaming layer, you know, GitHub lab streaming layer, um, does make a dot deb available for those using Raspbian. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really, it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> uh, I think like part of making it a uh, cross platform, uh, build easier was that there was some, some windows dependencies that, that the other, other platforms didn't need. <clears throat> Or at least that was that was when um, the Blue Muse developer was on. That was something that we talked about. Was like the the you know you had to like include all of libboost or something. Um, uh, anyway, it, it would be really nice. I, I talked with Neurotech X Paris and uh, Hans, who's uh, one of the principals. One of the co-leads there is uh he, he has a version i mean you know again like people have built it they just haven't pushed things back upstream and um anyway i, I think it would be great if we if anybody you know getting the word out to anybody who has built it on on raspberry pi um uh, to see if we can get some of those changes pushed back to um chad at uh who's maintaining lab streaming layer and see if if it, there would be possible to to have a real, you know, it, it make it the easiest would be to have a real uh, Pi LSL, a pip installable Pi LSL for for ARM. Um, but but I I agree. I mean I think I think that Kushal and, and some of the students have thought about um, just using. Um, uh, I think it's isn't there an app called Mind Monitor? I think you might have mentioned this, John. Um, yeah, and the Mind my, my Monitor is great. Works on it's on Android and um, iPhone. Um, can you get OSD it, out of that? Yeah, it will actually. Um, there's an option to uh, stream on OSC. I don't know exactly how it works, but I think you kind of set up a the phone as a streaming source of some kind, and then that can be picked up by a laptop, for example. Sure. Um, so it'd be like you know Bluetooth to phone, phone to OSC, OSC to probably. Well, I don't know if it's if that would be through Wi-Fi or through uh, think, or through Bluetooth again. I think I think they were connecting with using Wi-Fi to the to the Raspberry Pi and certainly yeah. I, I don't know how OSC streaming works but my monitor yeah my monitor has that option of uh, in some way kind of letting you use the phone as an OSC hub yeah uh, okay yeah and it so, gives you like, it gives you a port number in fact I think maybe it gives you an IP number um mm -hmm. I haven't tried it gotcha gotcha um did uh did you want to give us any any updates on eg notebooks or no major updates just um more more dev more just trying to clip like make things streamlined fix a few bugs here and there i mean i've i've been trying to stay in a loop with Jaden on the um on Muse, Muse issues on non-Windows platforms, <laughs> and yeah, he solved one one um, bug that seemed to have been introduced at the the new kind of one one of the things we have with the the new um, iteration of the library is a one-liner um, that lets you run 
several of the experiments with just essentially like run experiment and then giving details of like what your device is and which one you want to do and how long you want to run it for and so on. You're talking um, about run, run notebook. Run notebook, yeah. And uh, that's, I think for people like playing around with the tool, that's really a useful thing to know about because it lets you skip all of the notebook stuff. If you don't, if you really don't care about firing up Jupyter and, you know, going, running all these cells and, and initiating all these things and you just run that it's just, just like a one line a command line thing and then you get recording at the end yeah. um and yeah so he he found a bug that kind of was something to do with how that was set up that seemed to fix some issues that he was having yeah yeah well I, i'm definitely i'm still i'm still roping in more uh muse muse people who can um and yeah speak speaking of someone who has a muse and could test EEG notebooks. <laughs> hey, Abik, have you tried the Muse S with, uh, with the EEG notebooks, the latest EEG notebooks? I don't know if... Hey, Abik, can you hear me? Uh we we you're you're muted or we're, I'm not getting a okay <laughs> okay all right well I I was I was just gonna say if um, it would be great to see Muse S with uh, with Run Notebook uh, from from the the latest EEG notebooks and and see see, see if it's working for you but. I'm not sure. This is on my to-do list as well. I have, I have one. Okay. I've been <laughs> putting a lot of effort into trying to figure out how to actually do sleep recordings with it, which... Oh, you've got an S. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and we have some, uh, like, a project coming up next year that's going to be doing some cool stuff with it. But I, I'm just in kind of understand device mode. Sure. Um, and sticking it on at night and <laughs> sometimes getting <laughs> um, called... <laughs> I'm gonna get some funny looks from across the room. <laughs> okay. No, you look you, you look kind of strange in those things. Basically, sure. You've got sure. like a light a light on your head, like <laughs> yeah. kind of robot. I, I mean, it, it's um, uh, just recently, uh, and part of this was was actually seeing a similar product from from Zurich, but checking out the, the videos of actually using the Philips sleep device uh. and. And it, it, you know, it, it's it's quite a bit of prep, and you know, um, uh, yeah. And I think there are a couple sensors that you know. I mean, they're they're not giving us any kind of interface, or at least not describing it. But um, um, so what's the prep then for the Philips one? Is it getting the channel, checking the, the yeah, channel it's like, working and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the, the, the Muse app is kind of nice. It just, it it has these little bars and, it, you know, they go green and you're like, okay, it gives you a big tick and it goes ding. Um, and I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know what their criteria are, but when you get the tick, you're like, okay, good. Now I can stop worrying about this for a bit um so so that's good but then but then one of the things that it does do that app is it it will if if the the signal goes bad then it'll stop so you know if you're trying to and, and it'll also make a kind of like uh, 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 noise so you imagine you're trying to get like an eight hour record overnight recording and then at some point at like 2 a.m you you it, it, uh, and you're and you're listening to the these kind of ocean sound meditation right, things that right. they give you for like right. you know go to sleep experiences, and then and then at two a.m. you're like uh, 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 <laughs> connection bad, and you have to get up and cross the room and you know go to your phone and readjust it. So that that isn't entirely consistent with a good um, seamless overnight sleep recording i don't know what the solution is but john yeah. are you using the the normal muse app on on your phone yeah 
yeah, it's a really weird interface to to get them to collect your data. I've been using the on Linux. Actually, I've been having Bluetooth issue, issues with Muse LSL, and it like randomly drops. I put it in a script to like restart it, but it still kind of freaks out. But that um, app Morgan posted last week, Mind Monitor, uh, <laughs> keeps a solid connection all night, and that's oh, does it? Amazing. Yeah, no, right? I didn't know. I thought it was a Muse problem, but it must be like a a Linux so, problem. So you managed to because okay, I, I I started with that. Well, mm -hmm. a like yeah, had the same problem with Bluetooth dropping um, in general, and I still I still would like to kind of put together some decent code that re reinitializes re when it drops and stuff, but that is non trivial. I um, just put it in a script to, to like restart it, and uh, sometimes it just fails and exits, but then other times it gets caught in like a scanning loop. It's uh -huh. it's odd, but on the apparently I like dug into this a little bit, and on the latest Linux kernel, there's some like I it got to the point where like oh there's a kernel issue, like you're gonna want to like revert your kernel. I was like okay, this is too much, but yeah. So apparently <laughs> it's not playing nice with Bluetooth in that way. Yeah. But... I was trying doing it with Blue Muse, but it's a different kind of problem because the Blue Muse, there is like a, a command line interface, but um, I don't know. I have this specific issue with this machine is I don't, it's my work machine and I don't have like 100% admin rights on it. I have like 95% admin rights on it. <laughs> and the, the, the missing 5% is something like things that are associated with the app store, which, um, yeah. and that's, there's there's things around around that that make it mean, mean that those command line things don't work there. Um, oh, so no, I've had all like pain, yeah. yeah. But my monitor, um, like I tried with that, and and I just tried several times, just trying to do. Basically, every time I tried to do recording longer than five hours, it just wouldn't wouldn't work. Interesting. Um, I'll send over a I'll send over one of the files I got. So yeah. It's interesting because the first night I did it, it also died on me like uh, at before I woke up. But then the second time I did it, it did actually like last the whole night. And the mind monitor gives you a lot of metrics. It's not as fast as Muse LSL. So Muse LSL I think gave it gave it like two hundred hertz. This one I think only does like sixty hertz, but it also has like all of its big computer features and it's like FFTs and three different powers. But yeah, it didn't work the first time where uh -huh. it like killed my battery a little bit too fast. I think yeah, the... I might have also like taken it off on accident because I move around a lot when I sleep. Well, I I think I even for the music, I think I basically need to get a new phone to do this properly because <laughs> the, the battery just dies. Um, at, yeah, it works Sorry. well. It works while I am charging. So you're right. Where it's like the app. It doesn't really work in the background, so it needs to have like the screen on. But yeah, just like charge next to my bed. I know it's like bad sleep habits to have your phone next to your bed charging. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, I mean it's good. Yeah, so I'm trying to iron these things out so I can do some science so <laughs> eventually at some point. And and um, actually at uh, Nurtech X Paris, um, somebody joined who's who's they catch our YouTube recordings. And I forget who it was um, on September 24th, but we were basically talking about this issue of like, how do you keep a recording? How do you re automatically reconnect when you're trying to do like a, you know, six to eight hour recording? Um, and yeah, and he was like, can, can, you know, can you follow up on that? <laughs> uh, uh, they would really like to know. So. Yeah, if mine was mine was very hacky. It was literally a script that just was like an infinite loop that just whenever it crashed, it would just restart it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that it was that you that you think on the twenty fourth that was talking about this? <laughs> oh no! It probably it was someone else. Somebody else oh, was, okay. was asking uh, detailed uh, Muse questions, and I was like, oh, I don't want to start with my questions because like we'd be here all night. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it, but but. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it it really shouldn't be the this shouldn't be the the, the hang up uh, um, and 
yeah. I do. I do also. I I said this. I've been talking a little bit with um, Hubert at Interaxon. Who's, yeah. You know, a guy on the inside. <laughs> Hi, Hubert. <laughs> uh, you're great. Um, but so they have some in-house expertise, and I don't think I've kind of really tapped it yet. But um, I I think it would be good to um, figure out like it's. I don't know, get some kind of user group going or some kind of, um, you know, Muses pooled expertise um, forum. Because I think there's a lot of people hacking with that thing now and they're trying to do something slightly different than, you know, what people are generally doing with um, with the original Muses, which is like specifically stuff to do with sleep recordings. And there's a lot of technical things that I suspect people will be trying to reinvent and aren't particularly interested in innovating on. They just want to get to... Uh, an endpoint like getting a stable connection, um, denoising the data, uh, doing some doing a polysomnogram, things like that. So if if I'll put that out there and let it kind of, you know, mature in the ether, um, the I think it would be a good idea for um, pe for people who are interested to kind of hook up and start discussing these things, like a, a channel on. The neurotech x slack like that would make sense but you know i would want to i would want to kind of restrict ourselves to that if there are other people in the world who are also thinking about these things outside of that group yeah yeah so if you hear yeah like just communicate that if these discussions come up john said let's let's get together well cer certainly there is a muse channel um that uh that we could designate for this um at least yeah because it, it is did anybody talk about i mean you know i don't think you'd want to wear uh um you know open bci dry electrodes for that long but it's not an issue with at least maintaining a connection uh right i mean did is anybody i wish we had to wish richard like still joined us I had an overnight session and I haven't tried the open BCI uh, method, but like I move around a lot in my sleep, but I didn't actually, I have the spreadsheet, but I didn't actually go through to see like, Hey, there's a column in there where it'll tell you how good the connection is, what the connection looks like. And honestly, probably there's a lot of artifacts in there. So uh, I'll probably share that out since it is kind of tough to get, get the first time and then probably sure, poke sure. around. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I, I totally ignored um, giving people a chance to introduce themselves. If uh, anybody here is new, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself and telling us what brings you here. There might not be anybody new. <laughs> Well, if if not, it's coming up at seven o'clock, and um, so I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Ray Cassini is joining us from Montreal. Ray, are you, are you connected? No. Oh, yes, I'm here. Good, good, good. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and um, I'm I'm forgetting. I, I know it's like the EMT, the EMT group of INRS. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. it's the uh, Energy Materials and Telecommunications. Yeah, yeah. How it, we fit there? It's always a question of everybody in the. In the department, it's like, well, you don't do energy, you don't do materials, you don't do telecommunication. Why are you right. here? Right, right. But I, I mean, I, I would kind of like to know the backstory there. So, like, like, yeah, what, what is what is Muse Lab doing in in such a in such a department? <laughs> well, the the Muse Lab is uh, was founded by Tiago Folk. Yeah. But some of the of the uh, of the mu the mu part of the Musae stands for multimodal. Uh, okay. So multimodal now is multimodal multimedia. 
So in that sense, the way to enter to the uh, telecommunication part is through signal processing. Sure. So when Tiago started the lab was with a lot of signal processing for audio. For audio and suddenly like, well, there are some applications like audio from the lungs and audio for the heart. Well, if we are using audio from those things, why not to use ECG? Why not to start to analyze signals in general? So it became more like multimodal, but mm -hmm. like to any kind of signals. And that's mm -hmm. how the, um, he started to gather people from, from uh, people who do signal processing on physiological signals. And that's how I found the group and I joined. Yeah, and, and and I I first uh, I first found Musée Lab um, from a, a conference that he he was a speaker at that was down at USC. Do do you remember this? It was it was kind of recent. It was like a couple months ago. I'm trying to remember what the name of that was. Um, uh, um, Jody put Jody put me in touch with it. Let me see if I get the. Uh, Anyway, I mean, it was it was it was super interesting because, like, you could tell that this was a lab that that yeah was kind of like using using technology to approach a lot of different problems. <laughs> um, yeah, in the group there was like a, this kind of big division of people working with audio and people working with uh, physiological signals, but at the end of the day. It's like, oh, it's a signal. So we don't, uh, we share a lot of uh, methods. Sometimes yeah. like, well, uh, we use this in our, in our um, for physiological signals, we use this. Well, probably it can use, it can be used in audio and sometimes it goes the opposite way. And yeah, it's, well, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not finding that right now, but so let's, let's, um, let's turn it over to you. And I, I think you're going to split it up into, to two parts, is that right? Oh, well, yeah, mostly what I did in the, in the presentation is to split it in parts that is like uh, my PhD work and anything that I wasn't, wasn't for a PhD, even it was in the same time, but it was um, not the main the main branch. Yeah. The PhD and some current projects and everything, and all of these related to um, neural technologies. Sure, sure. So um, if if you haven't used Jitsi before, there's a button in the bottom left corner. Mm -hmm. It looks like a monitor, and you can you can take over. Yeah, I'm not sure. Am I sharing something now? No. So when you when you click that button, then you've got to select the, um, the either the window or the screen, and you can even choose like a like a particular Chrome tab, depending on. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm clicking in the, sh I'm clicking in the share your screen, but doesn't anything it's, happen? It's not bringing up a. It it should be bringing up a pop up. Okay. Oh, I don't know why it's blocking the the permission is blocked. Okay, let me just. Okay. Okay. Okay, got it. You got it? Uh, how do we do this? Well, how would we do better? So I have my slides. And I guess now you are able to see it. Is that correct? I think it will take over in a second. So far, nothing. There's nothing, oh my. So far, I see something on Raymundo's screen. Yeah, it's I a, see. It's a, okay, so is everyone on board? Okay, what am I? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Nothing's populated yet for me either. Yeah, I, might be my connection. Just, just, just one sec, Ray. Yep. Um, Uh, little name on the side. Yeah, it's a kind of blue, blue, purpley, it's not really blue, a dark blue screen. I refreshed my screen and I mean, I refreshed my browser and, and now I see it perfectly. 
Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Well, as um, Morgan mentioned, my name is uh, uh, Raimundo Casani. Yes, it works. Ray it works for works uh, fine for me. And uh, I'm part of the Musal Lab in the, that is the, in the INRS in, in Montreal. And, and I cannot change to my next slide. It's cool. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, who am I? How I enter here? Well, I'm an um, engineer in electronics and um, communications. In Mex uh, I did my uh, undergrad in Mexico. And, and I have been shifting towards more biomedical signal processing during my master's, where I was working mostly with uh, ECG. And during my PhD, that I was more focused on EEG. Now, nowadays, I'm a research associate at the Musa Lab. And what I, what do I do? I mostly do application based on electrosomething gram signals. I haven't, I have not worked with um, with EEG. That's something that is like, well, someday, why not? Like, we have electrodes. Let's just plug it in the on the guts and see what what we have. But not only the electro, not only the signals based on electrical potentials, but also like things like gaze, FNIRs, PPG, with the deceleration in different parts of the body, with the respiration signals, and mostly anything that can be measured from most uh, many things that can be measured from the body. And uh, well, um, in the last ten years, so, of, I have been working on this on how to create tools to improve uh, people's life. And um, yep, and that's me. Also for the uh, for the presentation, please interrupt me anytime you want, every time you want. So like, yeah, well, let's make this more interactive. And uh, well, other some of my other videos make this smaller, so uh, 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 would be better for me. To... Yeah, some other of my um, interests are like uh, exactly like like. like what we do on Hack Night, right? Like improving, repairing, modifying, hacking stuff. What kind of stuff? The stuff that happened to be close to me. Sometimes it's just messed, sometimes it's destroyed, something, well, it's part of the process. Data visualization, something that also I'm very interested to. Another, uh, I won't say random, but there are another different topics like languages, maps, diverse video game sci-fi sci and uh coming back to the what i do is this kind of um in a very general way this kind of applications like using physiological signals where some signal the the or different different um, modalities acquire and then and then we'll you know, digitize we run some feature extraction we run some feature extraction oh, yeah, so feature extraction, some translation algorithm, and sometimes it ends, ends there. Well, because there's a diagnosis, or is there? Um, are you okay with the slides, uh, John? Uh, hi, I'm not seeing any slides. I don't know about anyone else. Oh, I, I'm seeing applications with physiological signals. Yeah, okay, that's the um, one. That... So, so John, I I had to um. I had to refresh my browser and 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 kind of log back in. I, I don't know why. Well, I also noticed that Raymond's frozen. So um, oh, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll refresh and see what happens. Sorry okay. to No, 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 please. Uh, yeah, if if other people are having any issues not seeing, you should be seeing some some cool slides passing. <laughs> and, well, hey, Ray, uh, I had a I had a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's a little hard to hear you, though. Oh, for me? Yeah, if you could get it closer to your mic. Yeah. Is this one better? Perfect. It's so, almost the same, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Wait, one second. So for the for all of these different modalities, it looks like there's signal acquisition, then feature extraction. Do you put all of the different modalities into like one standard vector that you feed into feature extraction, or do you? extract features from each different modality and then combine them uh, later? Oh, well, that depends on the, uh, that depends in the multimodal approaches. Mostly um, a very common thing that I do is not to just to mix something. Well, that depends on the experiments. If I see that some of the features can complement each other, I can 
and they have the same time dimension. They can be merged in the feature domain. Otherwise, the, the feature the um, mixed goes in the decision part. And, uh, and sometimes it goes in the decision part, not only like voting, like, oh, I, I say one, I say zero, and the other one says again, it's not only voting, but sometimes there is a, th a second um, machine learning step that actually takes the answers from different modalities to create a, the final one. Uh -huh. mm, so, absolutely. Yeah. The, the latter case seems a lot more scalable since I'm sure that like you're always mixing and matching uh, different modalities and different sensor streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 it, it, that depends. Like, for example, during my PhD, I was working with, a, with only EEG, but in some other experiments, I have been mixing EEG, ECG, EOG. In some cases, it's necessary. In some others, it's like, um, not really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in some other cases, like, we do hyperscanning. So, they, well, we have the same modality, mm -hmm. but to, to people now. Uh huh. And and Ray, is that um, is that a motive? I, I mean, I'm looking at that particular sensor layout, and yes, I guess that's an emotive. It's exactly the one from emotive. I I found the I, I found this um this figure at, at some point. I think that I need to do we need to do for the for the lab our own to put actually some of the stuff we use. Like for example, here it has like the trapezius muscle in the back it's like well we don't really use at least not that one okay. so yeah to we need to we need to person we need to customize a, a figure so you what what kind of features we use what 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 kind of eeg are you or uh, system are you using uh well uh, we go for all okay Chris a biosemi if, if i remember well is for 64 channels Mm -hmm. But uh, on portable one, we have also Inovio of the, the Ada channel versions. We have a pair of Muse, the first version, one Muse 2. I just got a Muse S now that you were, men we were mentioning that. Like, well, now I'm, I feel like I, I'm getting, I should get back to, to the scripting and writing some stuff. And it's glad to see that, uh, who, to, to be aware who is in, isn't it? Sure. We have an Amotiv, which was broken. And actually, there's some hack that we have to do to to take it uh, to life again. <laughs> we had uh, we have some hardware for cloud technologies as well. I don't know is, that. Yeah, they they do they do mostly thing for ESR and for ECG. Okay. They yeah. they had one their e, their EEG devices like two channels. Uh, at some point, we've had in the lava uh, a narrow sky as well. Okay. Uh, what else? So an open BCI, of course. I don't know why I was missing the uh, the elephant in the room. Yeah, we have an open BCI, and so, so it, they will appear on the slides as, as we're talking. At some point, I have on the slides on, only on that stuff on what what have been using. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, and uh, well, coming back, this is like in, in most of the application in many applications like this. So we have them. Signals, feature extraction, and translation algorithm for a decision. But in many others, that is where the fun comes. It's like, well, let's just put it back to the person. Let's just put this for some feedback that could be visual, audio, a robot, anyways. So to actually to, to close the loop. And a bit of what we're saying that in this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit um, about what I did for the PhD um, in my PhD program. And, uh, and some on the other projects. Uh, well, the, on the PhD was very focused on dementia. And mostly on that is that the current uh, dementia, uh, at least in Canada, is affecting around a million, a million people. It's going to affect a million people in, in 15 years. And the current diagnosis for and Alzheimer's disease is the main cause of dementia. It's around 70% of the cases. But the, the current methods to diagnose it is like, well, well, they are intrusive and they are very expensive because they're based on imagery. Uh, or they, and, and also they are used on some um, subject, not subject, some um, neurophysiological examinations. The idea that with that is like, well, is it possible to use EEG for, to help the diagnosis? Because it will, it will help for some, some stuff to make it possibly less expensive, not invasive, portable, but as working with EEG, you will know that there's 
like the high sensitivity for EEG for for artifacts that in some cases to have a better understanding of what's happening what's happening with the brain you require more electrons and also the features the features the classic EEG features are based on healthy brains so probably they might those features might not be the um, the best for Alzheimer's disease and some of the outcomes from the um, from the PhD is like well we we're testing and we're kind of where we were evaluating if if methods to um, to automate the, art, the artifact removal can be are they useful are they actually is it possible to replace humans in in that task at least directly for Alzheimer's disease detection because that's that's one of the um, bottlenecks of the process and it's like well yeah yeah we found that uh, there are methods that can really improve the the, the can remove the artifacts so they are the accuracy for classification gets it the same levels as with signals that were cleaned by humans. Uh, also, the number of electrodes, like reducing, can we reduce from to a, a small set of electrodes? So the Alzheimer's disease patients, they will have to spend less time in the, um, with the clinicians, like probably if it's only eight electrodes, they will be able to put it in a few minutes. And developing features, well, this is just an example of how how it works to reconstruct the signals. How how it's usually done for different methods to put, to pass the EEG signals to a different space to do the filtering in that uh, in this other space. In this case, is independent is the um, independent components remove the one that is related to something that is not EEG and reconstruct the signal. So the the artifact is gone. But, and well, that's that's uh, another part that we're working on the new feature. So usually we have EEG signal, and the classic approach is to divide it in, in bands in class it, again typical bands. But also when when we do this, we lose all the um, information about time when when the times when the change were happening. So that's why it's like the most common thing is to use the spectrogram. So now there's information of time and frequency. But again, there's some limitation in this because even with the it's it's characterized the um, this character the power in time and frequency there is, is there's no characterization of how is this changing through time because it's not stationary. So in this case, what we were using is again to for each of these frequency bands of these frequency components. To obtain a second Fourier transform on them, in order to know to um, characterize the modulation. So now we know, like, oh, this is the alpha power. But what happens with this? The alpha power is changing with certain frequency. So in that case, is as a it provides better information on the dynamics in long term of the um, of the brain activity. In this, uh, we wrote this chapter in, in well two years ago. And it's behind the firewall of the uh, publisher. However, because I am the author, if you just send me an email and you just want it, I can send it to you without any problem. But yeah, we was published behind a firewall. Like, ah, that's, I feel that's like a scene in my past. Well, and, but uh, yeah. totally understand, totally, totally understandable. Yeah. Yeah, and also I know a friend of a friend of a friend that visit a site a side of side, I think, and they can get some papers there. Yeah, so it's there. If you, if you look for it, it's also there. And um, so this is some example of what, what we're looking with the modulation. So we have a signal that is clearly modulated, but once we obtain the spectrogram, even though it's modulated, it doesn't tell us anything about the modulation. So when, when obtaining a second, a second Fourier transform over this specific um, frequency component, we obtained that well actually was changing, and what which frequency was changing. This zero represents mostly the DC component. What is, now we can observe that well actually that signal has modulation at two hertz for this specific component. This is another example of uh, we were using this a lot for ECG signals. So that's more or less how it looks. So we have our ECG signal, the spectrogram. 
And once we obtain the, uh, the modulation representation for this spectrogram, we can see clearly here like a big component around 1.5 hertz that corresponds to heart rate. And as you can see, it's very easy to separate now from noise, this, this component. That if we, it's very it's easier to detect that if we need to compute the heart rate from the spectrum directly. And the same happens with, oh, uh, yeah, there's, um, we put all these codes, are, we create a toolbox for MATLAB and for Python and are in the, in the GitHub of the, of the laboratory. And that's what I was working, coming back to the PhD, that's what I was doing with, uh, with EEG. So to obtain all these modulation representations, to these 2D modulation representations, and compare between healthy subjects and Alzheimer's disease people to see if it's a difference in their modulations. And yeah, we, what, we, what we found is that um, there are some areas that actually, this is area under the curve. So the more red and the more blue actually is the more different between, between Alzheimer's disease and normal old. And also what we found is that actually these differences are not the same across the, across the different electrodes in, in the skull. So they are more prone to the back part of the, of the skull. And with this, again, this is, I, if I remember well, this, this plot is the average. So on the average, there are three main areas in the modulation domain that we can distinguish. That there is different between the normal, between normal aging and aging. And obtaining features from this, only the, only the power that will be like the double integral in these areas. We, we, uh, we test that these features actually are better predictors, are better, be, discriminate better between people with Alzheimer's and without it. Th that will be mostly like a, a very short summary of what it was my PhD, only to work on EEG for Alzheimer's disease, finding uh, automated methods, how to reduce the number of electrodes, and, and features that are specifically designed for Alzheimer's disease. And a bit more of one of the other things is when, when I arrived to the laboratory, there was an epoch around, there was a open BCI. We didn't have news in that moment, but to do any application is like, well, we need to code again if we just want to change the device. So one of the things like, oh, oh let's, let's create a middleman. Let's create something that speaks directly, that mostly that implements the, um, the communication protocol or use the SDK get data from that thing, put it in a, in a format, in a standard format, and then you can fit whatever application. And that's what it was called MULES, that stands for Musellab EEG Server. So we're able to communicate different devices and the, the output of these MULES was the same for, for it, regardless any the device. And we're able to, to test very nice applications, like if we want to change, to test all oh, this, let's try this, 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 um, this BCI paradigm with the uh, Muse. Okay, let's just change one line of code. Now is the epoch, now is the um, open BCI without changing a lot of the stuff. But then it started to mutate. So because we started to have, well, like we are acquiring data. Why not acquire data from other devices that are not EEG only? So we started to acquire data from heart rate monitors, from ECG sensors from eye trackers, for in this case, it was the PPG sensor from Empatica. Um, and the thing like, well, we have one mule, but can we have more? Yes, we can have many others. So at the end of the day, it was a bit of what, what you were asking, uh, the, the, how do we merge the data? Well, we can merge it in the sensor level. And that's one of the uh, projects that probably you have here of it, uh, Neural Drift. Well, was work was working there with uh, with uh, Yannick uh, with Yannick and uh, Ubert Ubert uh, Van Biel. and this is actually uh, this is funny. I really like to say that it was powered by mules, so it's not horsepower. It's well mules mules power, and we did that. So we we ran the the mules to acquire from two people signals from the mule from two muses, put the data together. Then no, well, was process it. Here is a bit misleading because there were two processing in parallel, two feature extraction in parallel, two decisions in parallel, and those two decisions were fed back to the, um, to the robot, in this case, to the robot to, um, 
one player control the left, one player control the right. And here is, well, I, I don't know if the audio is going there. Oops. Yeah, so here's a, a short video of people controlling it. So in this case, they need to, to coordinate their activities. So, so if they want to move it to the left or to the right. Yeah, let me just have to move it to the left or to the right. And, and, the, um, and this what is left and what is right is, is, um, is trained in the moment. So as people is like, well, now let's do, in this case, remember we're selecting two activities. One is like, well, close your eyes and relax. Open your eyes and do some mental arithmetic or some word generation. And with that, it's like, well, every time you close your eyes and relax, the robot, your sight is going to stop. If you do mental, if you do mental work, let's call it, your sight is going to work. And yeah, that's all. People had to collaborate to do some nice stuff. And at some point, we got uh, we got um, approached by a company that they wanted to do this kind of collaborative games for to treat people, kids, especially kids with uh, ADHD. And that's now for, on hold. Like, well, uh, let's see. We, we haven't we haven't started a, a formal collaboration with them. And and yeah, oh, well, I I forgot to mention about meals. Well, meals nowadays is kind of obsolete because this was 2013, and I if I remember well, it was more or less the same time when LSL started to appear and to get and to get traction. And it has some LSL has a lot of advantages compared with, with meals, and some of the disadvantages of meals is that it's built only for Windows. So well, that's that's one of the biggest one. It was based on LabVIEW. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so it was and, based on yeah, that, sorry. I mean it was it was really a, the the lab view dependencies were, was the problem. Yeah, it was lab view dependencies and people trying to collaborate like well, now you need to do lab view, you know it's scripting, but now it's graphical and wiring. Yeah. I did it in lab view because I knew lab view. <laughs> so it's like uh, in that uh, moment it's like when you're a hammer, everything becomes a nail. Okay. Okay. I mean, so I, that's I, I posted a link to um, Muse Labs uh, uh, GitHub, and yeah, so I am seeing quite a quite a bit of Lab View. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that's why I'm the I'm the um, the guilty one. Why we have Lab View in the GitHub, and and on things like um, source control, it's it's impossible with graphic. Uh, with graphic graphic coding like LabVIEW is just insane. If you just change the uh, position of a wire, it might be the same functioning, but now it's completely different because it's comparing binaries all the time. So yeah, it's not a good idea. So that's why in the lab, sometimes we still use it because of legacy. We have many experiments and stuff that use mules, but now every new experiment, like, well, let's start with a LSL. Okay. I mean, so that, that and, that's what you would go to as well at this point. Yeah, at this point, exactly. Like, well, let's do the LSL. And there is a, a, a nice example of that migration is in the um, in the Neurotech X, um, in the repository for BCI workshop. That's a BCI workshop that I did with Uber in 2014, I guess. It was all, it's old. And we made it for mules. So at the beginning was like, you need a Windows computer. You need to install all this big stuff just to run mules. And and after I think he and, and Naoto, they were working to translate it to LSL, to change all the data, data acquisition from mules to LSL. So in the branch, they have like the old mules branch and the LSL branch, which are, which only the difference is that acquisition part of the signal. And um, well, that's uh, regarding uh, the, um, the Alzheimer disease. It was so far it was with resting EEG, but it's like well, resting EEG. There are a lot of studies that have shown that many of the differences in people without in EEG difference between people with, with or without Alzheimer's disease come from when they are doing tasks because some of the parts that are controlled the navigation but are related to navigation in the brain are the ones the first ones to get uh, atrophied. With um, with Alzheimer's disease, so like well, let's let's try to do it with a special navigation, and for that we developed this stuff. To, again, it was based on 
on mules how to synchronize data in real time from eye tracking and for for eye tracking and um, an EEG. Here you see our star is over, over is there. And the thing like every time he's seeing at this cube, they disappear, are seen green, but also the EEG signals will be um, labeled as green. When he's looking away of the cube, it comes red and the signals get, this is in real time. So the signals get labeled as red. And it's because it's, um, yeah, and it's independent of the position of the cube in the screen. So yeah, every time he's looking at the cube, we see all these green areas, all the red when he's not. And the idea with, with this is uh, to process all the EEG data from a person when he's navigating and putting clues. Well, I'm going to put some clues. I just want to analyze data when the person is looking at signs or when he's looking at trees. So how to do this to, to parse the data? Because usually it's by at least up to so few years ago it was by hand, because it's a three D it's a three D environment, so the uh, the position of the tree is always changing. So by, by hand it took I think it takes like one hour to process half an hour of the video, but now it's like well it's just in real time putting the labels of where the person was looking. And and Ray the um, the eye tracking I mean is, is like located underneath the monitor. Is oh that, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and, yeah. Is, you may see the three dots in, the, in here. Yeah, and is that uh, is that an SMI system? It's a Toby Eye. Oh, it's a Toby. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Yeah, it was it was a Toby Eye, and then again, it's like, well, it's not that it's not that realistic because special navigation is not special in that sense that you are virtually navigating in, in front of your computer. So in this case, people have uh, have started to use VR for for many tasks to make it more realistic. In some cases, like a uh, treatment for PTSD or anxiety for phobias. But again, we require to analyze physiological signals not after the experiment, not before, but during the experiments. But having a biosemi with a um, VR headset is not going to happen because not only because of the size, but the people need to move. Mm -hmm. So like, well, we have portable stuff. Why don't we just start to mod VR headsets to VR headsets to, to put it in there? And that's what, that's what we did. That's what we did a few years ago. We here, you can see actually it's, a, it's an open VCI. What we did in that sense is to create a case as compact as we could with the open BCI with a battery and the charger. So just to create a, um, the amplifier for biopotentials that you don't need to, to move. It's like it's like that. It's just once you put the screws, that's it, you forget that what is inside. And uh, well, in this case, it's use the daisy board and we modify some Oculus. It was the Oculus DK2. Mm -hmm. Now we're using a, a Vive. Oracle is nicer to put the electrodes yeah. but with the Oculus. And we run some experiments, at least well, well, we put some electrodes in the faceplate of the, um, of the Oculus. And also we, we got one electrode near the collarbone of the people because by doing that, well, we have a reference in, uh, in the opposite side of the body. So we should be able to get still a very faint um, ECG vector, ECG potential. And, and yeah, we did. So it became more like a EOG, EEG, ECG, and even EMG, facial EMG sensor. Uh, we tested, we tested, we validated with uh, at least the first part with SSBP to detect that we're actually getting EEG signals. And uh, this is the validation that was the, only the red curve, the red distribution is the one that corresponds to SSBP. The other one are the control, either closed eyes or open eyes. So there is no, there is no the signal to noise radio for the, for the uh, for the blinking frequency is not present. We validate the the with saccades, so create, we create a task where the person is in the VR environment looking to a dot that is moving around. Mm -hmm. It's moving to eight positions, and with this to record the signals from the faceplate, and we're able again to see what actually we can predict the saccade. And and the last one was with with ECG. The ECG we were getting there is the red one. We can see that the R peak is quite small, 
but it's still it's it's very it's very clear. I mean, it's very clear to detect um, the R peak and to obtain heart rate from it. So yeah, that's a, one of the um, experiments. Uh, this is one of the prototypes we did. For this, everything is open. So we have the the 3D model is there. If you want to 3D print and put your OpenBCI inside and forget about it. And uh, and the, the the Unity scenes that we're made to to do this and how to synchronize with the um, with the data from the OpenBCI by using mules. So yeah, sorry, so before Windows this this decide. Yeah, it's something that I always say like, well, we need to translate it to LSL, but that's something that I that at least is not something that I'm involved for now. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's open for for other people in the lab to do it or other people. It's it's, it's okay. Uh, oh, oh. And then we have, um, I, I think we're close to the other, we have the Project Tango. It's a very, very nice code name. So because now we did a second amplifier. Like, well, this works fine. Actually, we use it a lot. Let's just create a second one. And now like we not only do hyperscanning, but now let's do multimodal hyperscanning. We are recording a PPG, GSR, ECG, respiration, and EEG. And with all these devices, the three the three axis acceleration simultaneously in two people while dancing Argentine tango. <laughs> so yeah, it's like a, the first part of the project. Is, well, we need actually to validate if we're recording signals or we're recording only noise and to explore because the, this work for this work working with uh, with um. They are not professional, but there are very experienced tango dancers that they report flow in, during dancing in certain conditions. They, they approach to all like, well, can, can we study together about the flow? Well, and, and what they, yeah, if you're, if you want to wear a lot of devices and stuff to record, then sure, why not? And even here, you can see that in the, in the ceiling, what we did to have a better, a better connection with the OpenBCI. We all the Bluetooth connectors are in just hanging in the, from the roof. In that sense, they were dancing all around, and the connection was very, very good in any time. Because in the some in the first experiments, we have it near the desk, but at some point, when people start to spin, you have two bodies between the transmitter and the receiver. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, we, uh, we came we came out with uh, with this is not very nice with not very beautiful solution, but it's it works very nice for the application. But then this was November December 2019. So when we were planning to recruit more people around February, everything stopped. So no more human experimentation. And some of the things that I have been working in the um, in this year as well, let's just add FNIRs to the party for the VR. And again, so we have some ex some examples of the VR headset and some examples of portable near devices. And there are two main conclusions here. Like the first one is, it's not going to fit as it is because, because of the size and the format of the FNIR devices. The second conclusion, I think that I should not be modeled for devices. And, but uh, again, so what we are doing is we are considering to create some it's so to create um, to develop um, to make to make uh, F near 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 sensors and somehow to add it to the biopotential that we have and to see that, that we are actually recording uh, F near uh, F near uh, signals. That's something that is on the on the going this year. And here, well, I just want to really uh, acknowledge that all this is uh, it's a lot of work, but a lot of people is involved. A lot of people from a lot of institutions. A lot of people from Neurotech X. Like, well, I remember talking with Yannick and over six, seven years ago when it was on the uh, open, it was BCI Montreal. The, the first name was given. And I, started, I started to work there, but... Uh, at some point, I got very involved into the PhD, and I, I kind of fade away from the from this scene. And now, without the PhD uh, in the middle, it's like, well, I really want to, to come back and see what people is doing and talking and how I can help 
because at least while doing meals, uh, as you have uh, as you have said, I work a lot with um, with the communication protocols, with the SDKs, and even for Labio, because no one was doing anything with Labio and EEG. Most of the um, the library for for the emotive and for Open BCI for Labio, I developed them. Mm -hmm. I develop as well things for Bluetooth Low Energy for Labio, mm -hmm. because why not? It's not supported and it's not supported yet. So what I wrote was the driver for Blue Giga directly for Labio. So when, when you mentioned people from USC Davis, like, well, come on, they can just write it. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard, but not that hard. It's, but yeah, of course, if it's possible to avoid reinventing the wheel. So some of these some of these people are are just uh, you know psychology students. They're they're not oh. <laughs> they're not engineers. Uh, but but I, I love I love the fact that you have done this. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I I completely missed that part. That they were from. So I, I thought they were more to electrical. Electrical. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Now it makes completely sense. Yes. These, these are these are cog cogsai. Cogs, I say, yeah, people, but but uh, uh, it's, it's such such cool work, and um, and yeah, we would we would love your expertise back, uh, um, looking over these these protocols, and um, you know, because like we've certainly, you know, e even as you as you kind of saw today, like lab streaming layer hasn't solved everything <laughs> or you know, yes <laughs> now i hear it, it's still it's still got some issues um and uh and when we're looking across across platforms you know we've we've still got some some small problems that that come up with on on linux and on mac and and you know not everybody can jump into you know PyGat and and figure out what the the Bluetooth serial solution. Yeah. Is. <laughs> so, but but that's that's a, a great overview from from uh, of of Muse Labs, you know, developments. Such cool stuff. I mean, especially with the, you know, I mean, this is like super early on uh, um, doing uh, VR integration, <clears throat> and uh, I love all the. I love everything that you've put up on GitHub. Yeah, th yeah, and and yeah, check out check out Ray's blog too. Um, so I, I want to let people ask questions. I because I know I I have questions about the Alzheimer's uh, uh, diagnosis. <laughs> I don't want to take you away from from the the tech questions though. Uh, I want to just jump in on the last thing that well the the. Second to last thing that was um, in the talk was the Tango stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, Raymond, I, I spoke to Ilona. She actually came oh, nice. by the, um, the lab and she, she was telling me that I, I, she actually just got in touch with me out of the blue and said, um, uh -huh. hey, I'm doing this thing in Montreal. I'm going uh, like tomorrow or something um tell tell me what you know about eeg and um you know f flow state and stuff and i was like i know about eeg i don't know about dancing with eeg on sense challenging <laughs> um uh -huh. but she was kind of buzzed that she'd found a you know a cool team in montreal and it uh, and now that, that was the last i heard of it was like it, it was just about to try the the first run so did it go well? Like, are you are you comfortable with the signal with the doing you know during dancing and is there no technical issues there? Well, you know, yeah, there, there are motion artifacts. However, one of the things that we notice is that they are very um, they are easy to be removed because usually are only the big motion artifacts that are present. Because the, the advantage now is that because of the um, I think I'm still sharing yeah. Because of the um, because of, because it's customized the the um, the cap now the cables are actually in, actually they are, they were shorter in the final version so everything is very tight to the cap so all the, everything is moving together with the head and I I have some I guess I can I can because it's for next week is um, is um, SMC conference and we're presenting the results for this in SMC. 
some of the what what we found is that the acceleration never goes more than one point one one from zero point nine or one point one uh, g's in any moment of the dancing. That uh, that it's simple, like the, um, we were, usually we use the uh, Wavelet Enhance ICA to remove artifacts. Mm. In that one, of the, it applies ICA and after a Wavelet transforming the independent components to find which very um, high frequency spikes and high, um, uh, from high amplitude uh, peaks and remove them from there and then reconstruct the signal. So we, even with, the, with that method, it's possible to remove most of the motion artifacts. From from me, yeah, yeah, it was it was it was surprising at the recent years. Like, well, we're going to find a lot, well, and we did, but they are gone. <laughs> and and how are you capturing uh, the dancer motion? Well, we did think capture the dancing motion, like uh, at least not the skeleton. What we were capturing is the acceleration for each device. Just, just, just the the device itself. So you you weren't yep. you weren't using any cameras or anything. No, no, just the device. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so yeah, and the, the I I think I think the also this paper is available when we present actually all the full process to make the um, the VR, but also the first part is how to make all the. Um, the specifications from the biopotential amplifier, because the weight is, I find I don't remember well. It's like a, it's below, it's around one hundred grams. It's very light. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. So it's not um. So even when they are stopping, it's not that the device wants to go to. It doesn't get inertia and once. Yeah, it's not. A, it doesn't get shaken uh, all around. I, I mean, from from the. Accelerometer. I mean, what are you then going to try? What are you going to try and get from the accelerometer? And and you know, what's what's the goal out of capturing the you know capturing the dancing? So it, it, you're not looking for. You know, I mean, do you care about the the movement related act? You know, electrophysiology, or is it is it more like higher order? things like, um, you know, like you were saying, like getting into a flow. Yeah, it's mostly on the second part to get um, into correlate with flow and physiological signals. The, mm -hmm. um, the, the acceleration mostly was like, well, all these, all these devices are capable to acquire acceleration. Let's just acquire it. And at least for EEG, my main idea is to use it for, to use an adaptive filter feeding the acceleration and then to remove all the components of acceleration from EEG. But even with, with the WICA it wasn't off because we had recordings from people in a treadmill, yeah. EEG in a treadmill, and that one is awful. However, with a, an adaptive uh, filter, it's, uh, it's easy to remove most of the uh, motion artifact. Mm -hmm. So that's why like, well, probably I will use it for that, but at the end we didn't need it. Mm -hmm. Which was uh, which uh, I didn't expect that part, but that it was going to be that easy to remove uh, most of the motion artifacts. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But yeah, for, with the movement, we we haven't thought of that. It's like uh, if we if we're going to use actually more movement data, like pose and the speed and acceleration of the muscles. I, no, but that that would be. I mean, awesome. it, it, it's 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 much improved, or you know, like. Like you don't have to do that much development in the sense that uh, even with one camera now, there's quite good libs for for capturing, you know, kind of like getting getting a skeleton from the from the motion. And I mean, it'd be it'd be better with more than one camera, but uh, but again, there there people other people are working on things like that. I mean, it would just, it would seem to be useful if you cared about the kind of rhythmic motor activity. And I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just coming off of seeing, you know, uh, Kyle Matheson's talk today uh, uh, of cycling, cycling EEG. And, nice. and, and, you know, his work it relates well to some of the papers that, um, if if you catch, um, I mean, Brain Products does this uh, Moby Awards, 
Um, and so they pick kind of like the the best papers where people are doing EEG of, of people in motion, right? So some of them are treadmills, some of them are like stair masters. Um, and, and of course, you know, Kyle's a lot of people working with people on bikes and, you know, in, in, in some of those, like you, like I'm sure you did with treadmills, you know, people are really trying to get out that kind of that dynamics or that kind of, you know, pattern generator, uh, that yeah. you're seeing in, in motor cortex. Um, but, but you're, you're going for, you're going for different areas and, and really just yep. trying to do kind of like noise suppression as, as best you can with the accelerometer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because even in the, in the treadmill that we're doing, it was more related to um, mental workload. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, actually, most of the electrodes were on the forehead. Yeah. Uh, so were you, were you giving them a task while they were on the treadmill? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are, they are having their, the fun of their lives because they have to concentrate and run. They have to concentrate and go on and a bike. Run. Oh, wait. So they're running on the treadmill. They are, I think it's, um, they are, it's three and eight kilometers per hour. Okay. So they are jogging. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so first of all, like 30 seconds in, I'd be more worried about my, my, you know, my oxygen supply and, you know, being, being <laughs> off the treadmill. Uh, but yeah. Um, interesting. I mean, again, like I do, I recommend, you know, checking out uh, Kyle's, Kyle's talk because what was interesting was the difference, or certainly something that he talked about, was the the difference in uh, what he got from a standing bike and what he got from people on a bike outside, and and you know okay. by by having truly mobile equipment, you know he could he could do those those recordings, you know, well. Um, that that was that was kind of interesting. I, I'm still. You know, like I still wonder about the kind of sweat effects that you must get if you, you know, do this over time, because uh, it's it's it must be changing your. I mean, you know, when they're jogging on the treadmill, the, are their impedance values going to change? I I I'm not the I'm not the analyzing that data. Uh, I'm pretty sure it does. It does change. Yes. I mean, yeah, change uh, for the better. <laughs> Well, it, 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 if it's a when right. it's a bit, yes. Otherwise, it will going to start to shortcut all the leg roots. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah you could. Yeah, it depends on yeah how how high density the system is. Um, uh huh. Did the did you say you were building um, those FNIRS devices, and and is that the TI chip that you were using? Yep. Yeah. That's a uh, yeah. That's a TI. Where is this? Josh. Josh, are you still on? Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with this with this chip? Uh, which one? Oh, I can't see the screen. Uh, for some reason, it's kind of pixelated. Remember? Oh, probably because I have my camera as well. Let me just turn my camera oh. off. Let's see if that helps. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Cool. So. Um, yeah, are you familiar with that one? Well, I'm I'm in low bandwidth mode, so I can't. Oh, okay. So a anyway, do, do you have yeah, this? Opt, opt to one one probably he knows it. Oh, the opt one one. Yeah, that's what I use in my yeah. uh, my HG. We know. Okay, okay. So um, yeah, I mean, I I would be I'd be interested. Do you make um? Also, those. I mean, is this project also up going to be up on GitHub? Is that for Josh or for me? Oh, so for you. <laughs> so, so Josh, Josh's stuff is all on GitHub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think so. I, I will need mostly to um, the thing that we decide in the lab with with, this, with Thiago. Let's see how. Um, sure. If but. But I try to I try to push to push everything like oh, okay let's just push for the public so it's, the fact that people have to redo the wheel is not nice 
like as a, a we're as we were discussing at the beginning about the, the um, kind of many people have the same problem. They just solve it once, and so people can go forward solve other problems. Why to solve the same thing a lot of times? Uh -huh. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I I'd be you know particularly interested in terms of. Uh, how how you're trying to? I mean, I'm I'm assuming you're going to go for for four heads uh, because uh, then you don't have to deal with hair issues and the yes. normal, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As, I, I, I'm not sure where the the picture in the the, the bottom left, uh, you know, was would be from a commercial system. I assume. Yeah, the 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 what. For exactly. the, those Near. pictures with the with the blonde girls is from the Artemis. Oh, okay, okay, right, right, right. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't remember the models, but those are both of them are Artemis products. Okay, okay. And mm -hmm. and the but, other one is something that is called Ethnears Explorer. That it's kind of a more like prototype product. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. the, that's the one I was wearing. Uh -huh. It's still very sketchy, not as sketchy, but like the quality of the build is. This prototype, okay, like the first iteration. And what was it called again? It's called. Let me just find the the link for you. It's yeah, called yeah. Fnears Explorer. Oh, it's Fnears Explorer. Okay. Yeah, by uh, Flux. It's a company from Portugal. Um, Yeah, just put the link in the um, in the chat. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, mostly around other stuff that I have done that is not related to this is mostly regard more closer to ECG and PPG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What well, What was the um, What was the watch that you were using for the Tango? Oh, that's uh, that for the Tango was the Empatica. Okay. It's Empatica E4, the one for about from Empatica. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and and that that ECG is is that is that uh, also a strain gauge? Oh uh, yes, it's for the respiration. It's also a strain gauge. Yep, and that yeah. one is a bio harness. That's a bio harness from Zephyr. And these the, are these all Bluetooth. The the uh, Empathica is BLE. The bio harness is classic Bluetooth, and the uh, OpenBCI has its own dongle. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know that. <laughs> I see. Okay. Oh, okay, so that's Biopack. Uh, I see. No, oh, no, Bio Hardness. Uh, well, I'm getting, I'm seeing Bio Hardness off of Biopacks, or maybe Biopack is reselling it. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, uh, uh, at least what's Sophie? Uh, you know, so I'll show you what I'm looking at here. Um, just kind of, you know, because again, these are. These are kind of great measures, even if even if eventually you want to do FNIRs without them. Um, getting you know ECG and and respiration uh, separately <laughs> are are kind of cool <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. for for FNIRs you know processing. Um, how can I? How much is this kind of equipment? Well, that's something that I'm not very sure about it. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm. I mean, is this is this this can't be that expensive? The ECG strap. The impact, the, like the bio harness. The bio harness is. I just look on Amazon. It's like honestly in the six hundred dollar range. Mm. But two seconds ago, I just bought it on eBay for like one hundred and fifty. <laughs> like two hundred. It was like. Okay. <laughs> that is. That's 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 awesome. That's awesome. Okay. And then Patika, well, according to their site, is uh, seventeen hundred 
Okay. The the new Empatica Embrace twos. There's like five new ones on eBay right now for two hundred dollars. Okay. Huh? Uh, well, uh, what does it have? Is it the same that the E four? Yeah, it's the it's the embrace and it, uh -huh. it has the the GSR, I believe. Actually, wait, you're right. It's the embrace, not the embrace too. Let me let me check it out. Well, it, it, it's it's still interesting and yeah, just a reminder that uh, to check, check eBay before. Uh, you know, it's it's yeah. If I was going to get. Um, if I was going to get a new eye tracker, I'd probably get it off of eBay. And it wouldn't be new, but um, very, very cool. So I just, just wanted to ask a little bit about um, the Alzheimer's uh, work and sure. um, like recognizing that this was this was perhaps a long time ago <laughs> and uh, but how much how much did you talk about in terms of this um expecting uh, like an amp, uh, alpha peak shift with with um you know mci and alzheimer's well yeah that, that, that's something that uh, we observe in the, all the um in all the channels in all the channels this alpha this alpha shift yeah the thing is like um the, the problem of it is like the, the alpha shift is not um for some people, it's more pronounced than for others. Uh, so when you when you use the distributions between, so some people some people have a low alpha peak, but even though they don't have Alzheimer's, and the opposite, some people even though they already have uh, Alzheimer's, is high. So the distributions there's a big overlap. Uh, so on the on the mean on the the mean the mean distribution actually shifts uh, towards lower to to slower, but the shift is not enough. To distinguish, uh huh. Mm. So there is a big overlap in that in that sense, and and, and yeah, and when using other classical features, it's like it's like all these details are lost, mm -hmm. or they are yeah, they're, because they are they got average in in wider bands. It's like yeah, the alpha peak, but now it's the in the full alpha range. So it's um yeah, it gets average out, and and, and this was. Was this using more like consumer hardware, or was this Biosemi, you know, sixty-four channel? No, this was with uh, the, with uh, twenty channels with medical with medical grade, yes, like clinical clinical EEG. Yep. Uh, uh. Yep. And so, if I remember well, it was two hundred hertz on uh, the sampling frequency of no, yes, it was two. Yeah, it was two hundred. Yes. Uh, so, do do you think that there is a a real role still for for you know EEG based diagnosis? I think so. At least, uh, yeah, it, it's for for diagnosis and also for, like uh, for screening. So, it's, so the people when they first visit to the doctor, they can have an EEG, and well, it seems there's something. It seems there's something, so let's continue with other examinations, and mostly in places where it's, it's far. Like um, remember reading like uh, two years ago about the, like um, in the news about Yellow Knife, like they were having their first MRI machine. Like well, people be were there even before before that machine. They didn't have any other option that travel probably to Vancouver to, Van <laughs> to Vancouver area or or I don't know where to to get all these examinations. Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of communities, and because some people say, "Well, it's only for it's this is a problem only in third world countries." Like, well, not even even in rural areas in any first world country, there are the access to this to this um, equipment is not that easy. And the lines, like by doing my research in the doing PhD, the lines in some provinces in Canada is around like six months to have a non-emergency MRI. Session or ex test. So yeah, I see. And and so, how much? Um, I mean, did you look at at using additional biosignals as well as as say things like? Because uh, I know like the Memory and Aging Center here at UCSF has has at least started looking at things like gate changes, 
you know, as as a predictor. Mm -hmm. you know, just just how a person walks down a hallway um, can can um, potentially like, and those would be, you know, cheap, uh, ch you know, cheap tests that can be done with kind of you know non million dollar hardware. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, in that case, that thing that no, we're working directly with clinicians, but they were very, very focused on we we want to we want to work on EEG. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did the 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 focus was specific for for that. Yeah, now I checked the I was reading a bit about the 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 EEG notebooks. I think I'm going to ask you a lot, John, in the in the next couple of days. Just, just, just to put it, okay, yeah, just to put it to run and see uh, what it's around, and yeah, because I got completely disconnected of the hacking for a few months, well, two yeah, years. The delighted yeah. to hear that. Yeah, and just to tell you, what what are your do you have like any specific interests, um, like re, uh, paradigms, experimental paradigms, or like EEG phenomena that you know really float your boat? Uh, not really. I, I'll. I'm more as you as you saw in the slides. I'm more like a person, like a jack of jack of all trades, master of none. I really, I mean, been jumping from a lot of places. Yeah, I, I got interested very easy, you know, in different stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, cool. Well, jump in and jump in and um, find find problems and solve them well, <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah that, um, sounds, that sounds good. That, right. We we have this project that we're kind of rolling out um ideally in november or, or possibly a little bit later that'll be <clears throat> with open bci folks um and a few other people who are chipping in to uh we're trying to do a kind of citizen science type international research study type thing okay. um and it basically kind of ask a bunch ask people who have a muse or an open bci to run EEG notebooks and give us their data and then we'll build a database from that and then um, we want to use it as a way of getting an idea of like the type of typical type of signal that you can get in that kind of out of the lab recording scenario and yeah. see if we can do some real like at scale citizen science things so we're, we're moving towards um, you know this as part of that that study we want to have everything nicely kind of all the wheels greased quite nicely and things running smoothly um and we're still finding a few bugs here and there so all your input mm -hmm. is uh, will be much appreciated yeah yeah okay okay that's nice I, like, I really want to to get again my my feet wet into the into the topic so I think, yeah, yeah that, I was a bit disconnected that, that would be awesome That'd be awesome, and, and yeah, you've got a lot of uh, you've got a lot of headsets there too. Um, so yeah, well, uh, here at home and now for now, I have the open. I have an open BCI with Daisy board and the Muse, the Muse S that I got. So yeah, because now I'm not in the lab and I'm not going to the lab because of the situation. But yeah, we can try with these two first. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I, I'm I'm. Uh, Keen to also try and see if um, if there's a way we can get uh, raw data from Emotive. <laughs> um, well, so. there, there, are, yeah, there. So, in our case, we were acquiring raw data with a very old, um, they, they, their old SDK. I think right. it's version one point something. Yeah, because when they start to change to update it, they they block the raw data access. So mostly we don't update the system, and that's how we still have it. So some uh, somebody last week um, told me about this uh, Psy kit. This is um, anyway. This is this is how they were. This is how they've been getting data from a motive. And um, all anyway, right, I, I I haven't I haven't tried it. Um, they do have a Slack, and and you can see that that you know it's non-trivial. <laughs> and that, uh, but anyway, 
Oh, it would be oh, it'd be nice because I I just I know that there are a lot of devices out there and, um, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, talking of the emotive, let me um, let me show you what what we did with an emotive that we had for the first when we're talking because when we're starting to put the electrodes in the um, in the device, I think we didn't have a we didn't have the open BCI, so we but we have a broken emotive. It's like, well, we can just use it, right? So this is um I, I just share um a post uh, what we did it was mostly to to break to really remove all the plastic from the oh, emotive yeah. to recover yeah. the electrodes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, we, we did this at, at, in Adam's lab too, in Ghazali's lab. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Because, yeah, because it was, it was Stefan Debner described it first, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're like, well, I think we saw it. Oh, let's just try to do it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we even had it working with, um, I mean, you know, again, like this was like a long time ago. Um, where it was all going to a, 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 an Android phone. Because um, what was that project called? Oh, Lord. Um, anyway, he, the, the, the Android uh, EEG project, uh, he, he now works for Google. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I was trying to find that. But, but yeah, I mean, we, taken out the electronics and put it in using a cap, uh, you know, to make it uh, work better for, you know, being more active. Um, yeah, I remember th that one. If I remember the, the paper from Devener, it's like uh, taking your EEG for a walk, yeah. something like that is the yeah. title. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh -huh. which is, you know, which is like very much in the spirit of everything you're talking about doing a tango. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah that was the point. And uh, well, it resembles a bit this cap now with the with the Open BCI. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Falk Minow is one of the authors. <laughs> so, I, well, um, sorry, I'm looking on the the Stefan Debner 2012 paper. Um, cool. Well, hey. Um, Dig dig into some of the Neurotech X GitHub, uh, uh, you know, more recent projects, and uh, and let us know what what's not working. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Yeah, so first, I, I'll start to see what, what what what's there and and see how where I could be useful. But yeah, first to awesome. try to try stuff. Yeah, all this nice stuff that people have put. Uh huh. Cool. Well, thank, thank, thanks for, thanks for joining us. And, um, and, uh, you know, next we're going to have, uh, our own Ryan Sterlich, uh, talking about VR headsets, but you might be, you might also be interested to see, uh, some of what they're doing for the kind of biosignals that you are also, um, getting from your, your open BCI hybrid. Mm -hmm. So, hey, so uh, and just for oh, sorry for for the person who who was checking the eBay prices, uh, yeah. what what's your name? Abic. Sorry, Abic. Oh, it's me, Abic. 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 Oh, okay, no, nice yes. to meet you. you know, nice to meet you. Yes, you have the very fancy empatical one designed for researchers, and that's not on eBay, but it's like ten times more expensive. The consumer grade one is on eBay, and it's it's nice and cheap. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, e even even better if if you've got the research one, and then we can get you a consumer one, and you can test it and see if there's actually any difference. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> well, we, we, we kind of want to do the same thing with the Toby, right? Is like, can we use one of those Toby four bars to to get the equivalent of you know an X sixty? And well, that, that's that's the thing we need to first before doing that part. We need to check the licensing because that sometimes there are small letters there. Yeah, there's yeah. a small I, that like I this. This right it that. can it can do it, but you if, if the the product can do it, but you as consumer you are 
by accepting this license, you are not going to do it. So yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was. That's. Uh, I'm not saying that this would this would hold up in in any kind of uh, legal action, but yeah, I was just going to ignore any fine print and move straight on. To it. <laughs> Just, yeah, what, that, what measures can we get? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think they are going to take any legal action for this. Like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. why? Just, just do it. I mean, yeah, just open it. I don't think we're in numbers that that actually matter. So yeah, yeah, but but it would be it'd be interesting. Um, uh, you know, because uh, again, like Al Alex uh, Milankovic, who's who's on. Um, you know, had had done all of this this work with with one of those Toby bars, you know, and um, and it really would be nice to see you know to see a kind of like comparison with a you know several thousand dollar version, and you know what what's the bar missing or you know does the bar have any kind of blind spots or you know, areas that, uh, yeah, because again, like we wouldn't do anything without uh, having a person in a chin rest or something like for, that. And for us, a bit of them, because we're using the IX from the Toby. Yeah. The main difference is that that one doesn't give you the data um, with a uniform sampling uh, frequency. It just gives you like, a, oh, this change, and it tells you when it changed. But it doesn't give, it doesn't give you a time series, a uniform time series. So you need to interpolate all the data to recreate what it may have what it may have happened. Um, okay, that sounds that sounds like more work than. Uh, okay, so stick with people labs. <laughs> 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 is, is that the answer? <laughs> yeah. S stick stick with the uh, open source people labs. Where is it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, every, every time we now we consider the stuff in the lab is like uh, because at the big, at the beginning we have the uh, the um, the epoch and we have uh, SMI software and we have stuff like well, let's just try to move to open because it's a uh, it's nicer. We can hack it. We can do we can do a lot of stuff without breaking uh, rules without having to 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 own the stuff because remember in this in the um, in recent years we started to move all over processing towards python like all over again to start to share our codes in the lab yeah, yeah so we started to do like well we need to do it open so if we if we want to use open stuff we also need to do open stuff for people otherwise it doesn't work yeah yeah but i mean it, uh -huh. it, it would seem like you could potentially get the uh, the Toby data wrong with your processing. Yeah. 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 yeah as you said, we did even compare uh, like one to one to a uh, research um, to a research uh, grade device. Which well, that will be nice to have. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. Um, we we should switch over to to Ryan uh, Ryan's presentation. And um, so Ryan is a San Francisco raised educator, researcher, advisor, and maker, and current currently at Noisebridge. Um, yep, and I'm here. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. Yep. There, cool. Yeah, are people able to see what I'm sharing currently? It's it's great for me right now, and I wonder if it's the same. Like if I if I just refresh my browser, I I show it. Um, uh, I can see it on my yeah. PC side, but yeah, maybe if people re Sorry. launch their screen. One sec. Yeah. I just see your camera. Huh. That's weird. Let me see. 
Okay. I may try sharing application instead of screen. It's funny because it's like when you were sharing, the P disappeared. I, so like I'm in the grid mode and I can see yours in like your small screen. But when I click on your screen to like bring it full. Oh, uh, oh, wait, I see away. it. Yeah, that's weird. I see it in I see it in gallery. Yeah, that <laughs> it might be a bandwidth consideration. Yeah, wait just a sec. Let me cancel my um let me stop streaming. Turn my camera off. Um it's uh yeah, wait just this. Sec, let me instead of trying to share an entire screen, I'll share an application window. Um, yeah, okay, dude, share is that working now? Um, yeah. Hmm. People able to see what I'm sharing right now, or I, I, I in gallery, I see uh, a bit of you, a bit of video, and then it's like, huh, and then it's black. I mean, I that's weird. Um. Yeah, I mean, this happens to a lot of people. Has anyone refreshed and been able to see it? Yeah, I refreshed. Huh. That's annoying. Um, let's see. It, do you think it's because you're recording? Um, that shouldn't be affecting it that much. Well, um, live streaming might be doing it. <laughs> um, how, how many things are you doing simultaneously there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, wait, did this. Is, is there, can second, you, are these, why um, is this running? Are oh. these Google slides? Can, can you share them with me and then I can. I can do the slides for you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, that works. Um, yeah. Exit. Share. Save. Morgan dot half. At Gmail. I will. Yeah, like I'm going to message you directly in Jitsi. Okay. It. There you go. Got it. Okay. And all right. So just tell tell me when to to proceed. <laughs> yeah, okay, so people are able to at least hear me? Yes, definitely. Cool. Okay, yes. so I'll try to go a bit faster than I was planning to, but so this is just a short talk on new VR tech and what it means for neurotech, BCI, and bio sensing based applications including gaming research and app and different applicational uses um next slide yeah so get a quick about me my name is ryan sternlicht i 
I'm based in SF and I advise startups. I'm a maker, educator. I do a lot of things. Morgan already introduced me and a lot of people on this call already know who I am. Next. Yeah, so, oh, someone did ask where the slides are. They're on Morgan's oh, view. Yeah. So check, check Morgan Huff. Yeah. Um, so first off, why VR matters. Virtual reality has a lot of uses in gaming, um, but it's going to have, over time, even more possible uses probably outside of gaming. And in the neurotech and biosensing field, um, it has a lot of applications in research, including testing different things related to cognitive research and different things like visual analysis, how our brain perceives visual data, um, how people react to certain environmental effects that can be simulated in virtual reality. It also allows for pretty accurate data acquisition of visual stimuli. Um, in education, it has a lot of uses in training um, for training people how to do different procedures, whether they're nurses, actual surgeons, or people who are in different fields trying to get better at what they do. A uh, current well-known use case is for training people on public speaking. Um, it's another great tool for teaching because you can have virtual labs, virtual environments that are can replace classrooms if you aren't able to go, which a lot of people currently can't go to classroom environments in person. And then there's a lot of applicational uses, including recovery from different injuries through using a virtual environment for different types of um, uh, movements and different forms of um, trying to recover different movements or motor function in the body. It could be helpful for remote surgery applications where a person is doing either robotic surgery or surgery from a different location than where the patient is. And then it can also be great for analysis of different data and different uses of neurotechnology and biosensing. Um, because you can visualize the data, you can interact with the data in a very different way than you can um, on a 2D screen or on a tablet. Um, next slide. Yeah. I, I just did some quick research on recent papers within the past year on only a couple websites. I could have gone much deeper and there is a lot of research in this field right now from everything from eye tracking to emotional analysis. There's a couple application articles related to using it for view, visualizing or viewing different surgery procedures using endoscopes. Um, and next slide. Yeah, I have a couple slides with just links. Um, next slide. So there's also a lot more neurotech and VR events in the past couple months. There's been a couple 
including medvr.io, hosted one earlier this week. Hogue hosted one very recently, and our very own Neurotech X hosted a Neurotech gaming event where we had quite a few VR application um, hardware people talk about what they are doing in this space. Next application. I mean, next. Yeah, um, there's up next um, next year, medvr.io is hosting a mm -hmm. VR neurotech um, or VR um, uh, medtech event in Boston, which is going, probably going to be pretty exciting. And there's lots of recent VR applications that... Um, are being developed. Kitware just like yesterday announced that they actually this morning they announced that they are going to support Insight VR with their first product launch, which will allow immersive learning for nurses and doctors. Um, next slide. Hmm. Yeah, so the current big issue is integration of biosensors and BCI with VR headsets and their accompanying applications. Next slide. So that we first need to talk about the headsets and the hardware side of thing, which is changing very quickly. Over the next couple months, there are three to four major VR and AR headsets coming out. So HP Reverb G2, the regular versions coming out at the end of this month, and the Omnicep versions coming out um, in the spring. I'll be talking a lot more about that one in a couple minutes. The Facebook Oculus Quest 2 is coming out at the end of, I think, next week. Um, Pre-orders are already available, and it is a standalone headset, but there's a few problems with it due to Facebook having some very strict requirements of using Facebook to access anything on it, and there's a number of security feature concerns that people have. And then in the open source space, Project North Star, which is an augmented reality headset project, they are on their way to releasing a new version by one of the um, subgroups called Combine Reality. They're re releasing a version called Deck X. Um, and we'll hopefully have them come speak at one of these hack nights in a month or so. Next slide. Yeah, um, and then there's all the add-ons you need for biosensing currently um, and BCI. Um, one of the easiest ways to add eye tracking to headsets currently is the seven invents in Drillion. F1 eye tracker, which is available for about eight different headsets currently and will hopefully be available for more very soon. I've heard later this fall, Neurable should be releasing their EG VR um, headset add-on that connects to Vive and a couple other headsets. It adds a number of electrodes to um, the head strap portion of a VR headset. And can uh, they have a couple demos they've showed where you can control things in a Unity game or Unity application using your mind. Um, and in the future, it will be much easier to add things like Muse, OpenBCI, and other features 
um, thanks to support through things like Unity and LSL. Um, and as was shown in the previous presentation, making sure things work together is a very important part of the equation, allowing people to even get data and use it in their own applications. Next slide. Yeah, so the upcoming best headset for neurotechnology and biosensing will be the HP Reverb G2 Omnicept edition, which has built-in eye tracking. Thanks to Toby, it has a face tracking camera that's pointed at the mouth, and it has a heart rate tr sensor on the headband. It is currently not stated what type of sensor it is, whether it's a, going to be a PPG sensor or um, if it's going to allow for um, pulse variability or blood oxygenation or any of that stuff. But they also have stated that they want to allow sensor fusion of these different sensors to allow for what they are currently saying is a um, system they think they know what they're doing with. I really hope they do, which is um, being able to say cognitive load um, accurately so that the application can tune itself. So if there's too much cognitive load, it could make something easier. If there isn't enough cognitive load, it can make a experience or application harder. Um, since this headset isn't available yet, it's hard to confirm the accuracy of their claims about being able to sense cognitive load using only a couple sensors <laughs> and I, but I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised, Ryan, that they're just doing it off of pupil dilation. Yeah, that's. That'd be I, they say they're doing sensor fusion where they're using the heart rate as well. Um, and mm -hmm. if I was sharing this, I would have jumped over to the HP's website, which has a number of different little things about how different use cases will have to either pay for access to these different data streams. So most cases in terms of education and research, it is free or very low cost, which is very good, especially if it allows for the full Toby eye tracking um, layer to be analyzed, which usually can cost a couple thousand dollars. Um, next slide. Yeah, I, I add some links related to some of the different um, things that um, I just mentioned, as well as one of the important things I want to mention is eye tracking doesn't just have use in actual interaction or data acquisition. It is very useful for rendering the actual experience because of foveated rendering. And uh, Toby currently says it can give a 39% uplift in terms of frames per second and a 66% decrease in overall graphics card utilization, which is a big deal because you can now offset if you have enough headroom above the frame rate of the headset, you could use that headroom to increase immersion and realism through things like ray tracing or 
higher resolution experiences, which can generally allow for more immersion in the experience, which can be important if you're trying to do something where you're replacing a real world testing environment with a virtual one, realism can be very important. Um, next slide. Yeah, and headsets like this where they have a unified a, um, a set of packages for programming and data acquisition um, APIs. Um, they lower the cost to access these tools and increase the ease of creation of applications. And they also allow for more accurate data and more realism in a much faster iteration process for developers. Next slide. Yeah, and in both NVIDIA and Unity are doing a lot of work on increasing the ability for immersive high fidelity environments in VR. So NVIDIA DLSS, which is Deep Learning Super Sampling 2.1, supports both better ray tracing and in VR, it supports both foveated rendering and DLSS in VR, which means you can, even without using foveated rendering, lower the necessary processing power. And if you can properly combine the two applications, you could really lower the overall processing need in an experience, whether it's a game or a training simulation or a recovery application. And Unity has some new pipelines, including one called HDRP, High Definition Render Pipeline, which it allows all of these different things to be used together, including ray tracing in VR, which very few applications currently allow. Um, and generally, I was going to try to show a few examples of what this can look like um, on YouTube, but maybe in a couple weeks, I'll try to build a demo in Unity that can show what this can look like when done correctly, um, even though I don't have an eye track headset right now. Um, but generally, there's going to be a lot of ways for developers to use this in the biotech and neurotech industry for their research and be able to use it much cheaper and much more efficiently because the hardware is so available and the development tools are so easy to use, which will mean there will be more research in the industry and more possible applications coming out of every different space in VR and in neurotech related fields with applications that want to use virtual reality or augmented reality as their platform. Okay, next slide. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to keep this a bit short for if there's any questions or anything, as well as I'll post the links and the slides on my website pretty soon. Um, but also a lot of these links have been 
shared in the chat logs from previous links and quite a few, I might also post this on the Slack and Discord in the VR sections. Um, yeah, um, thank you. And does anyone have any questions? I was just thinking with the uh, OmniSet, where they're getting the heart rate in uh, on the device itself, and oh, oh, you're right. One sec, let me get closer. So with the OmniSet, where they're getting the heart rate in and the facial features in, and hopefully, you know, I'm not too familiar with Unity, but there'll be some easy ways, you know, connect to those through that. I haven't seen any pushes for like. EOG, like the stuff that Ray was showing earlier, where it's, you know, biopotential around the eye area or the ear area or anything like that. Uh, in it, any kind of like mainstream projects, it only seems like the add-ons like mirable of the sort. Yeah, that's that's one thing where like thanks to um Unity and LSL and a couple other like software side things, it's possible to integrate those things but currently there is there are very few devices that are supporting or pushing for integration um with vr which is one of the problems like i'd say about 50 percent of the v um eg headsets under like three thousand dollars could integrate with a VR headset if they try, but only a couple are even working on it from what I can tell. Same with FNIRs, there's currently been almost no hardware development kit for combining FNIRs with um, VR. Um, heart rate, there's been a couple but generally there's kind of a disconnect still between um, the hardware and between neurotech and BCI and VR stuff. Um, even though on the application level, Unity is where a lot of this stuff is being worked on. And there are packages that allow MATLAB or um, all sorts of tools to integrate with Unity, which would allow you to bring streams from all of these devices into a Unity world and utilize it there. You're right. um, what are your thoughts on, so in the spring, the OmniSap is like the first VR headset to actually include like heart rate and honestly just like any kind of physiological sensors which like blows my mind considering like uh how seemingly simple it seems uh for the implementation that they're doing do you think that like yeah. next year they or like the next version might come out with the uh, eg or the sort as they're adding these sensors or do you think that there's some other kind of market reason why they aren't approaching I, these kinds of sensors I, I, a part of it i know is just for years, it's been the adoption rate. The amount of VR headsets is so low out even in consumer and um, uh, professional applications combined that developing for it up until 2020 pretty much has been a thing you'd have to get a lot of money to do very little with. Um, but eye tracking has been in VR headsets for years. I mean, the Vive Pro Eye came out 2018, I think it was. And I've tried it quite a few times. It has the same eye Toby eye tracking as um, uh, this head, the HP OmniCept will have. And then Seven and Benson's first version of their low-cost eye tracker came out in 2017. Um, but I, and they've now made kits available for about $200 that 
that can be added to, I think, six different headsets now. And then on the professional level, there are a couple VR headsets, like the VR, VR engineers, um, X tall headset that has built in eye tracking and built in um, IPD adjustment, interpupillary distance, which is important for making sure stuff is properly aligned with your eye. Um, and then there's, I'm pretty sure the Varjo, um, XR1 might have eye tracking. Like there's a lot of sets that have eye tracking, but you are right that EG, heart rate, EMG, and other types of biosensors have generally not been integrated yet. Yeah, so if if I could, you know, just hazard a guess, I mean, I, I think what you're seeing there is basically uh, a a device that is is set up to work with with uh, signals that we've got a lot of data on. <laughs> yeah, that's so, that's so, another. Right, yeah, you know, I mean, this is this is it, right? Like like they're not adding EEG because what would they do with it, right? But but you know things like things like heart rate and things like heart rate variability, right? Are are you know widely you know widely collected and they can you know basically you know a company like HP is gonna is is gonna work with with other companies that have lots of heart rate data and um, you know and. Yeah, well, it, it it will work. It will work with with big data companies, right? Yeah. So so face, you know, it, like basically what you're, and I don't know why they call it face, right? It's mouth, right? Or they they think that combining it with the eyes gives enough of a analysis of what the face is doing. Well, so, and, so, yeah, and and like like. Like you said, with the with the cognitive load being kind of like heavily marketed, right? It's like they're 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 uh, they're actually integrating Toby equipment, right? Yeah. So so you know they're feeling very sure about their pupillometry, and um, and yeah, I mean just just the, the the these are all things you know together with like we talked about when um, when Alex was. Uh, uh, talking about, you know, like emotional face recognition, um, you know, big companies like Microsoft will, you know, have enough data of like faces in particular emotions that, that they can, um, they can tag those from, you know, from a video stream. Yeah. And There's also been a lot of research into um emotional analysis of obscured faces. So like analysis with like either your eyebrows covered or with your mouth covered. I, I, I bet there's a lot with the mouth. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I, right now, especially it's. Well, I wanted to, I mean, I, I it, it might seem tangential, but I wanted to bring up the, the one, the one thing that got a lot of press uh, from this week's uh, GTC conference was the um, uh, was the AI uh, was basically the the neural net compression of uh, video streams. Oh and yeah, yeah. Did you guys see this? So so they they're doing full. You know, I forget like you know very very kind of high res, and I think it was like you know. 1440 by something and um anyway the compression was was insane right it was like 0.007 or 0.007 uh um uh percent compression and you know it, and it is remarkable and it's super cool what, yeah. what you'll be able to do with that when you know when you think about a company like zoom or somebody um but but the but the main thing about it is it just shows you how how little a little information is really changing when you know when you're focused in on a face right and yeah. uh, i bet the you know certainly if a person's talking um you know like like that's like the mouth and, and it's 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 expressions probably dominate 
um, you know, so much of that, that yeah. still incompressible bit. <laughs> I mean, they, I would not be surprised if like you could actually use, um, if for people who here who watch YouTube much, they who might have heard of VTubers or virtual YouTubers, mm. picture trying to do a neural net analysis of the motion of a virtual face. Mm. How accurate is that? Things mm. because those are actually using facial features to map to a virtual face and. How accurate is that being done? You can do a lot of cool things when you try to lower the resolution to its minimum and figure out if you can get high quality analysis. Like, could you get enough um, analysis from instead interpreting like 50 different points on the face, just interpret the curve of their mouth and their eyebrows and like one or two points on their forehead and cheeks and could you get as accurate data as if you had 50 or 60 points and nvidia has been doing a lot of research into doing things like facial reconstruction for um cinematic purposes where they're you're trying to overlay a virtual character on a image of a person um and there's going to be a lot of use for this stuff and at some point i think it will branch out to neurosciences um but i do think their compression algorithms are going to be come over much sooner. Things like compressing a lot of the eye tracking data or any of the like really, really um, complex data streams and see if they can use these neural nets to pull out important um, effects from the different data streams because the smaller the data stream that still contains the necessary info generally the better like mm -hmm. yeah. well, so so ryan um thank, thanks again for the the overview um you know the the hp set is 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 interesting you know it, it really is um and uh and i i think a lot about or certainly you know when abex asking about like why they're collecting those things um uh, it, it reminds me like that hp device reminds me a lot of open mind technologies in paris and oh, yeah what they're doing in terms of the, the kind of data that they're collecting and um and anyway it'd be a good follow-up to to talk about what they think they can get from that yeah and, yeah, I I want to have someone from HP talk about it. I they like there are already usable applications with it, like Ovation, the public speaking trainer, where it analyzes where you're looking and how you're speaking. Um, and I got to test that out at GDC in 2019, and. It was amazing how accurate it would tracking certain things, including using a bit of language processing to see what I, how long I paused. Did I have any verbal tics when I was pausing? Where I was generally looking? Um, how fast or slow I was reading re with relation to the virtual teleprompter? how far off of script I was going, like, it was really, really accurate for training people in um, public speaking, which is something that is really hard for some people to do. Sure. And it, it it's something that, like, 
people need to experience to get used to. And there's a lot of different like cognitive issues that I think VR could really help. Like, I don't know if public speaking would be considered a cognitive issue, but some people, it like whether it's a fear or they process too much when they're trying to speak publicly. I think there's applications in a lot of situations where even just adding heart rate and eye tracking at a lower cost to the consumer um, will make a big difference. Sure. So it, it's it's nine o'clock. So I, I want to kind of uh, start to wrap up. Um, partly because I know I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to go. Um, but, uh, th thanks again. C tell us, tell us when those slides are available. Um, yep. I'm curious to, um, well, I, you know, I've, I know I've been posting links to, uh, papers, VR papers in, um, in the Discord's VR channel. Um, I, I didn't even realize until today that there was a there was a VR Slack channel, um, and uh, but I'd love to love to see more of this. What what was particularly interesting on the Kitware um, is that they are integrating their Pulse uh, physiological engine. So yeah, that's it, really it, amazing. They were kind of partnering with a VR company, but what what Kitware is providing, and um, you know. Most people probably know Kitware from from VTK and and maybe from CMake, um, but uh, uh, the, the physio Pulse physiological engine uh, is is quite a remarkable um, you know physio uh, simulation device, and it's um, it, it is tracking multiple physiological systems of the body and is doing some really cool things. For both surgery and and anesthesia simulations, uh, as as well as like trauma, like some some particular body system is failing, or you know you've received a gunshot or some sort of uh, of wound, and then it it simulates basically how different systems start to misbehave. Um, yeah, in so, VR, that will be a big deal for training. That yeah. So practicing so, in VR is so different. I know a couple people at different universities who've been able to try different training simulations. There are a couple available on the Steam like gaming store in there. If you go in VR and then just search for like medical or stuff, there are about a hundred different True. applications already available for training in yeah. VR and but having physiological signals that react to what's being done in the right. virtual environment that is going to be and, much more immersive. Yeah. Now, one of the things that that I of course have have asked the the pulse people about is uh, they don't have any EEG. <laughs> oh, and and well, part of that is that sim simulating EEG, as as John can tell us, uh, is is hard. Or you know, simulating whole brain EEG is is hard. Um, I I'd, I'd really like to come back to this, and um, so please check out those links. And and when Ryan can, he's going to share more links with us. Um, yeah, so check the, I've got links, uh, lots of links in the, the meetup agenda for next week and the rest of this month. So next meetup, um, we're definitely, we're gonna kind of focus on Hacktoberfest. Um, and, uh, you know, so please, again, just check, check out the links for um, all the meetups for this month have, have already been posted. Um, but, uh, Next week, uh, it, it, as as Ray pointed out, it's the SMC meeting uh, next week in Toronto. So the um, there's actually a Toronto hackathon this weekend, uh, as well as a Samara one for BCI Samara. 
uh, um, both kind of focused on GTEC uh, unicorn systems. <laughs> so that's a, there's a, there's another system that I, I, I are you is, or is anybody you know going to be a part of that hackathon ring? Uh, no, I don't know anyone. Okay, okay. Well, check check the meetup agenda um, for links to that if if you're interested. Um, and yeah, the there's for for FNIRS, there's the FNIRS data blitz, and um, you know so that's that's a big deal in the FNIRS world. By the way, while we were talking, two jobs got posted. So one is at Kernel. So uh, an FNIRS engineer at Kernel is is uh, job posting and uh, an internship at Neuralink, <laughs> which is kind of cool. So ch check, check Slack. I, I posted the Kernel one in, in the uh, open FNIR uh, channel. Um, so yeah, FNIRS data blitz as well as Nearstorm. So this is using Brainstorm uh, for Nears processing is uh, also having a training uh, next week. Um, and yeah, and then at the end of the month, which again, we're going to kind of focus on this next week's uh, end of the month, we should be having a, a Hackoween uh, with, uh, with BrainWeb. Um, but uh, again, follow up on these links. Uh, the APCD Repernim course is starting next Friday. Um, Peter, uh, yeah, there's and there's a great, uh, great symposium of BCI uh, tomorrow in London. And uh, Ed Chang's one of the speakers from UCSF. Uh, there's other people, um, definitely check it out. The cool thing is it's in Crowdcast. So even if you can't watch it live, you can you can watch the replay, um, but you might want to check the agenda to register. Um, yeah, there's there's probably more. So check the links. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ryan for being both speaker and videographer and our live streamer. <laughs>